We work very hard to support the students that struggle with our classes, who may have leadership potential, but maybe not quite yet the math skills they need in order to succeed in our introductory classes. And we know that we help them, we'll attract them to economics, we'll keep them in the field, we'll be good for them and for us. Today, for the next 15 minutes, I want to talk about a different set of students that we also want to reach out to, because when we don't, they turn away, and it's their loss and ours. These students, they knock on our offices, and they say, how do I get involved in research? How do I find out whether grad school is for me? If they're, maybe they're smart, but they lack confidence, and you encourage them to explore all the options out, uh, available to them, and then they arrive in your office asking you to help them figure out what those options might be. And you're like, eh, I don't do experiments. Do you know SETA? And of course the student does not, and so we tell them, well, you know, take a little bit more advanced classes, come back in your third or fourth year, and most of the time the student ventures off into chemistry or engineering or cognitive psychology, where they have the lab sciences, and they grab the smart students, right, as they come off the bus. So in today's talk, I want to convince you that it is maybe easier and less time intensive than you might think to engage students in economic research. It is also very rewarding. And I want to share with you a toolbox that you can use to do that that is very flexible and scalable that you can use to guide independent research at the undergraduate level or maybe even introduce, use to build an introduction into research class. Last year, I wrote up my experiences on this topic, and if you want to follow along, you can use your smartphone to uh, access those notes. It's not an academic paper. It's really more an experience report, or you can follow the URL on the page. So in this, the, the approach I take is that the student works mostly independently on guided tasks that I provide. I meet with them every one to two weeks or as they hit certain milestones. Critically, the meetings with the student are self-regulating. So if the student has done a lot of work, we have a lot of interesting things to talk to. It's fun for me. If the student hasn't put in a lot of effort, they in and out of my office, sometimes in under two minutes. So on average, for every 20 hours of student effort, I spend 30 minutes discussing it with a student. And that seems to be, that uh, ratio seems to work out um, quite well. The benefits for me, for the instructor, are huge. It's fun to mentor smart students, to see them grow and mature. And there is some, at least anecdotal evidence, that across disciplines, the more students participate in an undergraduate research experience, the lower the dropout rate in grad school. The benefits for the students are huge. All the students benefit. They really like the program. They get to learn whether research is a fit for them personally. They develop new skill sets. Uh, they learn they prep for a grad school. So what the obstacles a lot of my colleagues mentioned that keep them from supervising undergraduate research is that first, the students don't know what they're interested in. Because if we give them a question in the field that they think they're interested in, they don't want to work on it. They don't have the stamina for it. The questions that the students ask themselves are really too vague, too big, too small, have been answered already. The students don't know how to ask an interesting question. And even if they did, they really don't know how to do anything. They don't know how to read or write professionally. They don't have any programming skills. And more often than not, you, if you try to t actually teach them, they then take that sk skills off to an internship and uh, never to be heard of again. So I address these um, issues with five component program. I take three to five weeks, and I'll talk a little bit about that, in about each of these steps in detail in a minute, take about three to five weeks to actually identify the student's revealed interest, not necessarily what the student thinks they're interested in, but their revealed interest. 
We then spend some time to find a manageable yet economically interesting question. The student learns programming skills, develops data analysis skills. They get to read broadly, write often, get feedback, and then eventually they complete a stepping stone project. So in the next um, 10 minutes or so, I want to zoom in a little bit on each of these five components. And again, there are more details available on the no in the notes online. So to identify the student's real interest, I give them this following task. Read all the abstracts, abstracts only, of all the papers published in the JPE, QGE, or AER in the past three years. And then while you're reading them, I just want you to read them and have a reaction and classify your reaction according to the following five criteria. One, sounds all Greek to me. I'm sure we've all had that experience. Wasn't this result obvious? Number three, I guess someone had to look into this, and I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs> number four, that was a cool insight. Glad I learned about it. And number five, man, I wish I had done this. So even just giving the student the permission to judge and evaluate and record their personal response to an academic writing engages them and changes their reading experience. Now, for the purposes of this project, I'm mostly interested in these last two categories, the papers that pop up, and I'm really careful in distinguishing consumer and producer preferences. Find that distinction super important, so I quick, briefly want to zoom in on this. For me personally, as a consumer, I have preferences over these four consumption goods. I like skiing, I like to consume economic papers and economic arguments, as well as the news. I do not like eating chocolate chip cookies. They have gotten way too sweet for me. As a producer, however, my, differences, uh, my preferences are different. I don't like to produce news. I don't like to produce skis. I very much enjoy producing economic arguments and economic papers. And I even enjoy baking chocolate cookies, chocolate chip cookies, for my children. So, we know intuitively from all our ex personal experiences that consumer and producer preferences differ. And so I find it important to carry that distinction over into professional activities. So when the students come in with me, tell me what they like to read about, what they're interested in reading about, I take that as consumer preferences. And then the papers that they tell me about that they wish they had done, they wish they had had that idea, that is what for me reveals producer preferences. And so I meet them, you know, maybe after they finish reading a year's worth of abstract or half a year, depending on the students. We discuss a little bit the paper that they read. We talk about how you cite papers, how you talk about papers. And usually, very quickly, within a few of these conversations, it is clear that the papers that the students are drawn to come over and over again from one to three different areas of microeconomics. So I take that then as the revealed field of interest. Once we know what this interest is, I direct the student to some publicly available data. Now, if the student is absolutely dead set on a topic that I don't know anything about, that is far out of microeconomics in its broadest understanding, I might direct them to a colleague. But if it falls into labor economics, anything that could be classified as applied microeconomic theory, I direct them to some publicly available data. And I just get them busy and ask them to familiarize themselves with that data set. Tell me what variables you find interesting that you might not ever know that have been recorded. It is really a straightforward process. I meet with them a few times to you know, very briefly just check in that they're reading the variables correctly, that they interpret them uh, correctly. Once they have an understanding of the data that is available, I ask them to generate some questions within the field that we previously identified was their interest as a producer. And so I ask them, OK, come up with three to five questions. Tell me why that you might be able to answer with that data. What variables would you use? What might the result look like? What would we learn from that answer? Who would care about this? Now, not surprisingly, the first couple questions that the students come up with are not very good. They might be politically wrought. They might have been answered before. Yeah, they might not actually be identifiable. But we talk about them. The student goes back and generates another set of three to five questions. We usually repeat that for three to five times. 
So by the end of this process, the student has generated between 20 and 50 different questions they could possibly answer, and you see an improvement in the quality of the questions they ask. In every single instance, one of those 25 questions at least was such that with a little bit of refinement and guidance from me could be turned into a reasonably interesting question. It's not pathbreaking, might not be publishable, definitely not A or material, but it is a reasonable, economic, interesting, economically interesting question that can be answered with that data available. So then in parallel to that or following, I start to give the student guidance to develop their programming, reading, and writing skills. For the programming, I really direct them to, text, uh, to textbook, to online resources, and I just ask them to complete, uh, to, to work on the programming skills until they can solve certain problems. The key to the success, to the success of this particular step is to really make it incremental. So for students who have no programming experience whatsoever, I actually start them on a basic 256 language. I don't know how many of you remember basic from the 80s. There is a free compiler online. There is a free textbook available online written for middle school students. So our college students should have no problem working through that middle school textbook on how to write in basic. They might be able to test the prime number. They might be able to play a game with a computer on rock, paper, scissors within three to five weeks. Once they have this first programming experience under their belt in how to algorithmize something, what a loop is, what a variable assignment is, they more easily transition into Excel where I start to get them working on data. It really ties in nicely with the data exploration exercise of the previous module. And then once they have done that, it is not as hard a transition to Stata or R or MATLAB where I first start them out reproducing all their data exercises they did with Excel and then they learn on a need to learn basis depending on how their project evolves. It's a lot of work for them, not so much work for me because again all of, these, uh, all of the available resources online, I check in with them, I give them encouragement, just make sure that they're staying on track and that they know that yes this is hard but you can do this and uh, they're usually quite happy to just to see the progress they're making. For the reading and writing, I have come up with a reading list that pairs a book that is broadly accessible and written for a wide audience with a paper from the same subfield that I like. And I ask students to read both the paper and the book in tandem, and that is one unit. So I might assign notch for a first area into behavioral economics, Sam Walton's Made in America for first furry into the theory of the firm, the working poor or capital offense for developmental economics or information theory, and I pair that with a corresponding paper. For each of these units, I ask the student to write a reflection to their future self to remind them of what it is that they like on the book, what observations they had, which of those observations can be explained by what they learned in Eco 101 and which ones can't. And it is really um, an exercise in critical reading. And then when we meet, uh, we, I look at their reflections, I give them feedback, I might say, try to shorten your sentences a bit, you might want to restructure that use the active voice more, there is no very unique because unique is one of a kind, and so on and so forth. Okay, so again, breaking things down into incremental step and making things accessible. So once we have all of these four parts um, completed, we have the pieces in place, I now know an area of interest that resonates with the student. I have a reasonable question that is interesting, manageable, and in that field, and we have the data to answer those questions. The student has basic programming skills, they have a broad understanding of different fields in economics, and they have an understanding of what an economic paper looks like, and I know where they are in their writing skills. So at this point, it really starts to look like somebody who can do a research project. We have all the pieces in place, and so really the task now is go do. Right? And so I'll get them started finding some literature, how to use Google Scholar, how to look up references, and it really becomes self-perpetuating at this point. We still check in every one to two weeks, depending on the progress they make. 
we might figure out that they need to learn some more linear algebra, some more combinatorics, some econometrics, but again, resources are available. And we know that students learn really well when they understand the need to learn something else. Okay? So it's a matter of providing the resources, helping them navigate that, and giving them feedback, challenging them, providing them encouragement, depending on what is needed. The timeline for these modules is very flexible. You can combine them in a variety of ways. Um, I once had a very smart and ambitious student who approached me in his very first year, first term in university, and we spent the winter break between his, uh, in his fall term uh, to determine the interest. They developed the question. He started the programming at the same time that he did the stepping stone project. He, did the, he worked through the reading list and completed the stepping stone project by the end of his very first summer. Okay? So yes, this, is not, this might not be the timeline that works for everybody, but if you have this superstar student that you know, uh, might be getting a little bit bored, then this is a possibility. A more approachable, realistic way is to really spread it out over two years. So this could be year one and year two in college, or year two and year three in college, where you spend the first summer after you have a question to really dive into the literature, to maybe take a writing course to develop the writing skills. You develop the programming skills in the fall of the second term, maybe even take a computer science class, learn some Python, and then in the second summer you complete the Stepping Stone project. So this is a stepping stone project. It is meant for the student to see, to have a research experience, to know the writing, to know what the process looks like, not necessarily to result in uh, publishable work. So where do the students go from here? Well, it really widely varies. Some students walk out of this and say, never, ever again. Some students say, this is great, uh, it was fun to look at that, but I'm not ready yet, but I, I want to aspire to complete something like this at a later point. Some students complete this, and they turn the Stepping Stone project into an honor thesis. They use it to qualify to work as an RA for, another, for a colleague. They develop a, a second, more mature project that then in turn results in a publication. So out of all the students, I have supervised about uh, two dozen or so in this process, only one in ten actually completes the Stepping Stone project. But all of the students engaged find the experience extremely beneficial and valuable. So here are some student quotes, um, and there is a timeline showing at what point the student dropped out of this project. So this is a student who started to read the abstract and <laughs> immediately realized research isn't for him. It's more boring and more strenuous than he thought, and uh, he has an internship lined up in industry, and now he knows that you know, research is not a good fit for his disposition. I then had a student who already had made a documentary and was always very torn between her economic studies and wanting to be a filmmaker. So as we were writing down questions, as she was asking questions that she was interested in, I always tried to bring her to a question that was answerable with the data to narrow it down so we could have one answer at a time. And that was extremely hard for her. And she found she was much more interesting in opening up questions that are not very useful in economics, but make for really good uh, film documentaries. So she learned that lesson about herself, pursued more film working, filmmaking, less economic research. The next student actually developed the question, developed the reading and programming skills, and then realized that the question was really too challenging. It didn't make sense for them to continue. It was taking away too much time of, uh, of his class. It had, the project was a bit too ambitious, but he found that having had that experience, he really t learned differently in all of his classes going forward because he knew what the, what the goal line looked like, where they were moving toward. And this student has since graduated, has since published, and is currently a PhD student in the economics program at the University of Toronto. And then last but not least, uh, this student finished the project. The most important thing left to do is to start thinking about what my next research project is going to be like. He graduated, spent two years at the NYFAT, and is currently a graduate student at HBS. So 
Just to summarize, here are the program components. The um, time there at the top is the time that the student spent. The time at the bottom is the time approximately that I spent. And you can see how you can really combine some of these components, maybe into a semester-long course, um, the top four components maybe into a year-long uh, course, pick and choose as you see fit. Lessons learned, supervising student research can be more easy to enter and to exit for both you and the student. And yes, there have been students that I have sat down and said for my, you know what, this isn't working out. I try to make the steps incremental, challenging, to really foster the um, right selection bias, yet manageable. I support the students in their pursuits, and all outcomes are informative. If they learn research isn't for them, then that is a useful piece of information to have learned. That's a beneficial outcome. If you have any, this is always work in progress. I'm always working with more undergraduate students. If you have comments, feedbacks, Please let me know. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.